All right, hey everybody. Uh, sorry for the technical issues, so I'm pretty sure this will get sorted out a lot more smoothly uh, from now on. So welcome to ME564 um, Mechanical Engineering Analysis. I'm Steve Brunton. I'm going to be the instructor for this class. Uh, I want to start off by just saying I'm really excited to be teaching this class. Uh, this is some of my favorite material, and I really want to make this fun and interesting for everybody. Um, I know that this is going to have some elements that are review for a lot of you, but pretty quickly we're going to get into new material, I hope, that most of you haven't seen and that you'll find really, really useful. Okay? Uh, so I wanted to just go through the syllabus briefly, uh, introduce myself and my TAs, tell you a little bit about the expectations for this class, and then uh, we'll actually just start talking about some of the material. Okay? So you can always find uh, material at the course website. I'm just using my faculty homepage, uh, you know, faculty.washington.edu tilde. It has the class assignment 202. Oh, really? Because the two rooms were listed. That's right. So like 20 of us are waiting. Oh, there. well, so please come over. Yeah, that. come on over. OK. <laughs> um, and uh, slash ME564. So right now, all that you're going to find there is a PDF syllabus. But in the future, I'll actually have a website with links to the homeworks, links to the exams, and I'll upload every single page of my course notes and code that I write in class. Okay, so you'll have everything. Uh, okay, so usually people want to know about grading. This is kind of the most uh, pressing matter. Okay, so I'm going to have two exams, a midterm and a final, and then I'm going to have about five homeworks. So I think. I think five homeworks is about enough. Sometimes it'll be every other week. Sometimes they'll be back to back uh, from week to week. And here are the dates. Normally, I don't have my exams weighted quite so heavily. But this class is, come on in, uh, this class is going to be on your qualifying exam. So I'm going to be writing the calls this year and next year. And so I want to give you a little bit of practice. So you're going to get my exams. They're worth a quite a lot because I really want you to, um, to prepare for them. Come on in, everyone. OK. OK, any questions about exams or homeworks? Maybe we'll just wait until everyone comes in. Okay, does everyone have a seat? Yeah? Okay, good. So for those of you who came in late, uh, you can find the course website here. It's my website, faculty.washington.edu slash Tilda Brunton, ME564. Okay? Uh, you can find this PDF syllabus, and soon there will be links to everything, lectures, uh, lecture notes, codes, homeworks. Everything will be on this website. Uh, there's a midterm and a final exam. They're both take-home exams. So I think I'll hand one of them out on Monday, and it'll be due on Wednesday, two days later. The next one will be handed out on Wednesday, and it'll be due in class on Friday. Okay, so you'll have, uh, I think, as much time as you want to, to work on them, but the exam should take between two and four hours. Okay, so for those of you who came in late, um, first of all, sorry that it told you to go to a different room. Uh, and second of all, I'm going to be writing the qualifying exam for this year and next year in math. So these exams are going to be kind of practice for that. So that's why I have them worth a lot of the grade, and the final exam is cumulative. OK? OK, any questions about grading or homeworks or exams? Nope. OK, cool. All right, so I'm Steve Brunton. Uh, you'll be able to find me in the Mechanical Engineering Building in room 305. I'm going to have office hours every week directly after this Wednesday class, so from 10.30 to 11.30 AM. And you can also set up times for appointments. 
Okay, so I have a pretty flexible end of the week, Thursdays and Fridays. Mondays and Tuesdays, I'm almost completely booked unless you want to come in at 6 a.m. Okay? Uh, but I'll always have this one hour office hours, and you can always schedule things with me by email uh, later in the week. Okay? Uh, and you can find my email and phone number. So uh, my teaching assistants, Rhiannon and Scott, are you guys both here? Okay, they're in the back saying hi. Um, so they're going to have office hours, something between two and three office hours each every week. And we're going to have these probably uh, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday because homeworks are going to be due on Fridays. Uh, and they're going to figure out the exact schedule and get back to us really soon. Okay. So this document's going to change a little bit over the next uh, probably two or three days. And if you all have any questions about anything at any time, please you know, feel free to interrupt. So once we really start diving into material, a lot of this class is going to be discussion oriented. So I really want to get questions and ideas from you. Um, so I'll give you a little bit about my philosophy. I'm going to be teaching you what I think are some of the most powerful tools in analysis for engineering systems. So we're going to learn ODEs, linear algebra, complex analysis, PDEs, all kinds of great stuff. Uh, but I really, really want to focus on applications. Okay, So I have tons of applications that are near and dear to my heart. So uh, for a lot of my life, I've worked on unsteady fluid dynamics for mixing enhancement, turbulence control aerodynamic uh, performance improvements on small-scale aircraft. Recently, I've started working a lot on um, disease modeling and neuroscience. And so we're going to have a whole range of applications, weather and climate systems, some applications in control, space mission design. Uh, and if you have anything that you find really interesting, then I would like to, to kind of build that into this class also. Okay. So part of my philosophy in engineering analysis, I want you to be able to do things by hand. Right? We're going to learn about Fourier integrals and how to solve PDEs and ODEs and all of this by hand. But I think equally important is that you know how to implement these in a computer. Right? This is the age of computers. We all have, like, I carry a computer around in my pocket that's faster than the first Cray. Okay? This is kind of amazing. And so I really want us to be thinking about how we can implement these tools in computers. Uh, and so my language of choice is MATLAB. Just a quick poll of hands. How many of you have used MATLAB or currently use MATLAB? How many don't? OK. So if you don't know MATLAB, I think that, that's totally fine. It's not like a super central part of this. Um, but I would recommend you know, downloading a copy or going to one of the computer labs and just getting familiar with it again. OK, because I am going to be doing a lot of examples in MATLAB. Uh, there's a student edition of MATLAB you can buy for, I think, 100 bucks, um, or your advisor can buy it for you for 100 bucks. Um, I would recommend it. I think you're probably all going to use it a lot for the next however many years. Uh, there's also a MATLAB laboratory in the ICL building. So B022 and B027 of this building, there's a bunch of MATLAB terminals so you can log on for free. And you can also secure shell in from your laptops or home computers. OK. Questions about computing or any of that? OK. Um, the textbook is engineering, Advanced Engineering Mathematics by Kreisig, the 10th edition. Uh, how many of you have this book? OK, so a lot of you have it. Uh, how many of you felt that it was overpriced and too heavy? I think it's a little overpriced, and it's way too, it's like 1,200 pages. Um, let me just see if I have it still. OK, yeah, so this is the book. Um, I don't carry a copy around. I think it's ridiculous. Um, I'm going to try to move away from this book in the next two years. So for right now, we're probably kind of stuck using parts of this book. So you can use it as a reference. We're going to use it for some homework problems. I'm, I haven't opened the book yet, like, except for about two minutes. And so I'm really going to spend most of the time doing material from my own lecture notes. Um, all of the videos are going to be online. So this class is recorded. You'll all have access to the videos on Canvas. Uh, I'll upload all of my notes. We're going to use this for reference and for the homeworks. But if you don't feel like buying it and you want to scan the homework pages out from a friend, that's totally fine with me. 
if you want a good reference book for the future, you know, I have a copy on my bookshelf. You could use it for that. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah. I think you should, well, OK. If you want to use it as a reference, I think using a previous edition would be fine. But I'm going to assign some homework problems out of the 10th edition. And so that's the key thing. Every year, there's a few people that solve the homework problems for the 8th or the 9th edition. Uh, and all of the problems are going to be from the 10th edition. Okay? But hopefully, someone has a copy of the 10th edition that they're willing to kind of share and make available. Okay? I think it's like 250 bucks. I didn't know books were that expensive. <laughs> um, seems really expensive, so I didn't buy a copy. Anyone? Uh, any other questions about the book? Yeah. I think I did a quick search on Google or something. Cambridge puts this out for free on PDF. They do. Yeah. Cambridge does. It was some something like Cambridge. Yeah. Okay, because I found it from an Iranian website. Oh. Um, <laughs> but I bet you can find it somewhere. Um, I'm not recommending that you do that. I think that would be technically illegal. Um, they, I think that they would be upset if no one bought any books. So maybe you can pool and buy three or four books. <laughs> Uh, okay, so that's the book. Um, it is a pretty good reference. Okay, I don't want to like I don't want to downplay the book too much. It is a good book. It has almost everything. Two hundred and fifty dollars is a lot of money. Okay, uh, so this is the Canvas website where you can you all have access to the videos. Okay, so this video will be online shortly. I think it's probably streaming actually. Uh, so it's uh, canvas.udub.edu/courses, and the number is nine one seven. Five three eight. So nine one seven five three eight slash users, and I'll put this link up on my website. Okay, so once I have the course website on my page, you'll have this link forever. Okay, good. Let's see if there's anything else. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know if you can access these videos after the quarter. Um, so I've done this flipped version before where we had video lectures. And so what I do is um, I use Firefox. And I downloaded this plugin called Download Flash and Video. And so when the videos are actually playing in Canvas, you can just download the Flash video to your hard drive. That's going to fill up your hard drive, unfortunately. Um, I think they're about a gigabyte every lecture. Okay. Um, okay. So we're using MATLAB. We have a textbook that's pretty extensive. Uh, now I'm going to tell you about the syllabus. Okay. So this is a really rough syllabus right now. Um, I have a pretty good idea of the first part, but I'm still developing the next part. So this is the first time I've taught this class, and I really want to kind of get a feel for what everyone's mathematical comfort level is and how far and how fast we can go. But the basic kind of main idea is that we're going to build up to solving really complicated ODEs. Interesting. So ODEs are the basis of how we model physical systems that change in time. Okay. So we're going to build up to doing ordinary differential equations, um, some pretty neat stuff. So we're going to do nonlinear systems, high dimensional systems. Uh, we're going to look at chaos and the numerical integration of ODEs and vector fields. Uh, we're going to get into some numerical calculus. And to do that, we're going to build on foundations in linear algebra. So how do you solve large systems of equations you know, by hand and in MATLAB? How do you do eigenvalues and eigenvectors and use those for stability analysis? Uh, so we're going to look at controls problems and fluids problems and all kinds of neat uh, engineering applications. So usually when I teach kind of the more applied math version of this class, I say that I don't require any physics knowledge. Um, you know, it's I'll write down the equations, and you can take them for granted. But I think since all of you have great mechanical backgrounds, it'll be really nice to have some motivating physical examples uh, you know, to study these problems. So I'll also include some vector calculus, um, just you know, as a review mostly, but some of, the, some of the highlights of vector calculus. And I'll focus on numerical aspects also. What I really want to do this year 
in 564 and 565, which is next quarter, is also start to introduce some more modern concepts like data analytics. Okay, so all of us are going to have mountains of data. That's never going to change. From now on, you're going to be dealing with a mountain of data if you want to. If you want to, you'll have access to mountains of data. And so I want to show you how we can integrate some of the new techniques in dimensionality reduction for large-scale systems, machine learning, visualization for engineering systems. Okay? And you know, this will be kind of a topical overview, but it will give you the roadmap so you can know where to go and look you know, when you're actually doing research problems. And that's my real goal. I want to develop your knowledge so that you can excel in your research in mechanical engineering. Okay, that's my number one goal. That's, this is my favorite thing to do. I love teaching. This is you know, my number one priority this term. So I hope you all you know, really uh, get a lot out of this. I want to know, so almost everyone has had linear algebra. Is that right? Anyone not have linear algebra or ODEs? Okay, so I know that some of you, um, you know, it might have been a long time, and so we're going to start from the basics. We're going to start from the ground level, but we're going to build up pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, okay, good. Any questions about the syllabus? Remember, it's really rough. <coughs> Sure. Okay. Okay, good. So I'm going to go, um, I want to give you some motivating examples. Okay, I want to tell you some of the things that I like to study and some of the things that we're going to bring into this class. And then uh, if we have time, I might work out kind of a simple problem in MATLAB. And then on Friday, we're really going to hit the ground running with ODEs. Okay. All right, let's see if I can... Okay, can everyone see this? Yep. Okay, so like I told you, I work a lot in unsteady fluid dynamics. Uh, this is a simulation of fluid flow past a two-dimensional wing. This is a really toy model uh, simulation for, for example, this could model the flow past a small insect wing, like a mosquito or a fruit fly. And the UW actually has great resources in the biology department. Some of the best people in the world that do insect flights are at UW, and so this is a really uh, dear problem that I've been working on for a long time. Um, what's kind of interesting about this, we could write down the equations of motion for a fluid as a partial differential equation, so we'll you know, learn how to solve PDEs and analyze them in the next quarter of this class, or what we could do is we could take our computational domain and break it up into a million boxes and turn this PDE into a million dimensional ordinary differential equation. Might be nonlinear, it might be really nasty, but that's pretty much how we solve all problems in computational physics now, is that we discretize them somehow. Uh, we kind of project our PDE onto a million discrete little boxes, and then we solve that ordinary differential equation. Okay, so this is just one of the perspectives we're going to take in this class, is that almost everything in the world is a big ordinary differential equation. Okay. These are just some other cool movies of, you know, plates, wings moving up and down. Um, we're going to build the tools to understand things like the Navier-Stokes equations and elastic equations and all kinds of other fundamental physical laws that you're going to be using in your other qualifying exams. Um, I've used these methods computationally a lot to study fluid mixing. So here's... If, what you would have if you have a big you know, steel plate in a bathtub or in a swimming pool, and you start plunging it up and down. And if you put some dye near the plate, these are the mixing patterns that you would get in that fluid. So this computation used to have to run on a supercomputer with about 50 cores. Uh, and using some of the methods we're going to talk about in this class, we were able to speed it up so it runs almost in real time on a laptop, which is kind of nice. So we're going to learn about how to integrate particles through unsteady vector fields. So if you think of a little plankton or a little piece of food in the water, it moves along based on the fluid velocity field, which is spatially varying. It varies in time. It's really complicated, maybe turbulent. 
Uh, and so we're going to analyze how to integrate those particles and understand things like how a jellyfish both feeds and propels itself at the same time. So I'll just show you this again. So these blue particles get ejected into the wake of this jellyfish. They produce kind of momentum that pushes it forward, while the green particles get entrained into its feeding chamber. So in one stroke, or a series of strokes, the jellyfish both feeds and, eat, uh, and propels itself. And by using some of these analyses, these ordinary differential equation analyses, people have actually been able to make artificial jellyfish. So this is rat heart tissue grafted onto a little mold with eight pacemakers. And so if they put this in uh, you know, an electrolyte solution, they can pulse it and actually have these pacemakers fire and, um, and this little synthetic jellyfish starts to swim. So this is really uh, a great progression from theoretical developments of how to model a PDE to simulations in an ODE to actual uh, engineering design that's truly bio-inspired. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples. This happened, I think, about two years, yeah, two years ago. But it took a lot of iterations. The first, the first few of these didn't, didn't go so well. So time-varying vector fields are also really, really important to understanding climate and weather and pollution and disease spread. Uh, so here we're looking at the Gulf oil spill pro propagating through the Gulf of Mexico. Again, this is an unsteady, highly complex, um, you know, multi-resolution problem. There's tons of scales in space and time. It's time-varying. But we can solve this as a numerical ordinary differential equation using data. Right? We collect data from satellites, we can build a model, we can predict where oil goes. And a few years ago, someone actually used this analysis to find all of the coherent structures and patterns across the entire globe. So these are, I think, based on particle integrations. So they dropped little uh, virtual buoys and integrated them for, I think, 200 days forward in time. And this tells them where all of the dominant eddies uh, in the ocean currents are across the entire world. This is another example of a supercomputer computation that we can now do on our laptops. Um, and this was only four years ago. So it's kind of remarkable how fast things are moving now. OK. I also really care a lot about pollution. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the cool tools developed in math have been to study where to dump pollution more effectively so that it doesn't mix up in places where we live. Um, we're also going to use the solar system and space dynamics as an example of a complex ordinary differential equation. Okay, so if you write down Newton's laws for, you know, let's say eight and a half planets and a sun, then you get a really complicated, nonlinear, chaotic dynamical system. And some of the tools we're going to to learn in this class are going to help us, for example, build efficient space missions if you wanted to go from Earth to Jupiter and then spend time around each of its moons to design a science mission. Okay, so that's one of the applications uh, of, of what we can do. So this is kind of a controls application. Uh, another one is, this is kind of neat, I wish this said Blue Origin, but they don't release videos of their tests. Uh, so this is stabilizing an inverted pendulum. It's a really fancy, expensive inverted pendulum. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, this is an inverted pendulum controller. Okay, so you have this nonlinear differential equation for an inverted pendulum. And if you use a small angle approximation, so if your control's good, then it stays pretty much vertical. You can linearize your differential equation, and you can build a control law to stabilize it. Okay, so this is another example we're going to, to do in this class. Pretty remarkable. So they actually developed uh, the controller for the lunar lander uh, really at the dawn of computer control. And this was a much harder problem because they couldn't uh, throttle their thrusters. They just had to turn them on or off. So they had to use what's called bang-bang control. So they would bang-bang their thrusters and try to land this tin can on the moon. Um, much, much easier now. Okay, and then the last uh, example I'll talk about 
are disease networks. So some of us might consider Twitter networks to be a form of a disease. Um, this is a map of a polio epidemic going through Nigeria. So a lot of us were raised thinking that polio was eradicated. It was eradicated here, but it still thrives in some parts of the world. And so uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for Global Good stationed over on the east side here in, in, uh, in Bellevue puts a lot of resources into modeling and controlling disease uh, such as polio and malaria and now Ebola. Okay. So that's another great example of a time-varying dynamical system that could be described as a PDE. It could be described as a high-dimensional ODE. Um, we could solve it using analytic techniques or numerical techniques. Okay. So this is just kind of the, the very, very rapid overview of some of the applications that I have in mind when talking about this material. Um, I want you to be able to bring what you find interesting to class. If you have a topic that you find you know, great and interesting, we can build our problems around that. That's, that's great. That would be ideal. Okay? Any questions uh, about any of this stuff? So do we need to learn anything about the control systems? No. No. So, I mean, control systems are pretty straightforward once you have a good foundation in ODEs. Um, so we'll think about, you know, analyzing ODEs that are being controlled, but you don't have to know anything about control design. Yeah, you don't have to know about fluid dynamics or disease modeling or climate or weather or any of that. We're going to start from scratch and we're going to build everything up, okay? Okay, good. Uh, what time is it? Okay, so it's 10 a.m. I'm going to finish a little bit early today because I want you know, to, to have some time if anyone has questions after class. Uh, so I'll just do one quick example before... Um, Let's see. I'll do one quick example before we go. Okay, good. So one of the themes that we're going to be talking about when we build ODEs, we're going to start really, really simple with ODEs, but what I want to emphasize is that systems of equations that we deal with in real systems get big very, very fast. Okay? So all of the systems that we're interested in probably will scale up to very, very large systems of equations pretty rapidly. Okay? I'm going to start with a toy example uh, to try to illustrate this idea. Okay, so we all know that there's three types of weather in Seattle, right? It can be rainy, cloudy, or nice. Okay, today it happens to be rainy. Um, so if it's rainy, then tomorrow there's a 50% chance that it will still be rainy. If it's cloudy, there's a 50% chance that tomorrow it will still be cloudy. Uh, if it's nice today, it probably won't be nice tomorrow. But it could be rainy uh, or cloudy. And I'm going to say that if it's nice, it could be 50% rainy tomorrow and 50% cloudy tomorrow. And maybe there's only a 25% chance that if it's cloudy or rainy today that it'll be nice tomorrow. Okay, so there's a couple of branches missing. Okay, if it's cloudy today or rainy today, then it could be 25% chance that tomorrow it'll be the other one. Okay, pretty simple. This is just a toy model, um, what the weather is going to be like in Seattle from day to day to day. Okay, and so what we can write down, uh, first of all, we're going to represent this as a vector. So we're going to say that our weather today is rainy. Okay, so rainy, uh, nice, cloudy. So our vector represents the probability of what the weather is today. So the weather is definitely rainy today, 100% probability. Okay, and we're going to say that the weather tomorrow, the probability of the weather tomorrow is going to equal some 
a matrix times the probability of what the weather is today. Okay, pretty simple. This is a very crude model for the weather. And so we can write down this A matrix. We can say, okay, well, A is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0.25. Okay, so this is the probability that it's rainy today, nice today, or cloudy today. And the rows are going to be the probability that it's uh, rainy tomorrow nice tomorrow or cloudy tomorrow. Okay, so the rest of this matrix we can just read off of this chart. Uh, so if it is rainy today, nice tomorrow, there's a 25% chance, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0.5. Okay, we just built a model. Okay, this is a mathematical model to describe the probability of the weather in time I mean, I made all these numbers up. You could collect these from data and actually figure out what the real statistics are. Wouldn't be too difficult. Okay. And so the way that we're going to use this model, this is essentially a form of a differential equation, or it's a difference equation. It's a little more general. Okay. So I have the weather today, x1. This is, uh, you know, it's rainy. And I can get the weather tomorrow by multiplying this vector by this matrix. Okay, x2 is a times x1. That'll give me the probability of the weather tomorrow. Uh, so what is a times x1? It's just 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. So unfortunately, there's a 50% chance it'll be rainy tomorrow and 25% chance that it might be nice or it might be cloudy. Okay, and you can keep going, x3, you just multiply it by another a. You multiply x2 by a, and you get the weather on day three. And you can keep going, okay? And this is a basic weather model, okay? This will tell you how the weather changes in time based on what it is today. This isn't the best model, this is pretty crude, uh, but this is, you know, we're using vectors and matrices to represent a dynamical system of the weather. Okay, we're going to code this up in a couple minutes. Any, any questions about this setup? Okay. Now you could imagine that you, so this system has three states, right? It has the probability that it's rainy, nice, or cloudy right now in Seattle. But you could imagine making this much more complicated, right? So we have a globe, and I can't really draw. But let's say that's, that's terrible. That's America. And you could break this globe up into one kilometer boxes across the entire globe. And you could also say, let's say that the state is not just rainy, nice, or cloudy, but it's also temperature and humidity and pressure, wind direction and speed. Okay, and so immediately our three-dimensional model becomes a millions or billions of dimensional model describing the weather on the entire globe. Okay, you could represent it as this kind of a probability transition Markov model. In fact, that's what people did for a really long time until they came up with better models. Um, so this is just a quick example of how systems get really, really big, really, really fast. Okay. This model could equally well be whether or not I am infected with Ebola, I'm in recovery from Ebola, and I have never had Ebola. I'm like, I'm, you know, not infected. And there could be some probability that I could get infected if I'm not, or that I might be in recovery. I guess you'd have another box here, which would be that you're dead. And you could imagine that that four-state system, there's one of those for every single person on planet Earth. Okay, so now we have a 24 or 28 billion dimensional ordinary differential equation describing how disease might propagate through the entire planet. But fortunately, that big A matrix has almost entirely zeros because I don't go to Africa or China or India on a daily basis. So I come in contact with about 1,000 people every day. So my row is only going to have about 1,000 non-zero elements. Okay. 
Just an example of how systems get really, really, really big, really fast for systems that we actually care about. So there are people right now modeling the spread of Ebola using gigantic matrices with mostly zeros. Okay. Okay, so let's code this up and do a quick simulation and then we'll end for the day, okay? Okay, so I want to make this class kind of have a pretty solid MATLAB component, but we're going to build everything up from scratch um, and hopefully those of you who are not super familiar with MATLAB will just will be picking this up. Okay, let's see. Laptop, projector local. Okay, so we're in MATLAB. Um, again, so I actually do recommend you buy this product, um, but there are things you can download on the internet. Okay, so we're going to make a quick script to analyze this system. Okay, we're going to clear all. We're going to create our big matrix A that gives us our transition probabilities. So A was 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0.25, that's one row. Then 0 0.250, 0 0.25, that's another row. And then 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, that's the final row. So this, remember, gives me the probability of the weather tomorrow, given the weather today. So let's say x today equals 1, 0, 0. Today is rainy, right? Today was a rainy day. But we want to know what the weather is going to be like tomorrow. So we're going to say 4i equals 1 to 10. Let's say we want to know the 10-day forecast. We're going to say x tomorrow is equal to a times x today. And at the end of every day, tomorrow becomes today. Yeah. Or today becomes tomorrow. Super simple. OK? I have a vector representing my probability today. This is a column vector, so these semicolons mean that it's arranged as a column vector. I have my A matrix that tells me what my weather will be like tomorrow, given my weather today. And I'm going to cycle through 10 days and compute what the probability of the weather is on day two, day, you know, day one, day two, day three, day four, up to day 10 from now. Okay? So if I run this, let's save this as weather. I get all of my, maybe I'll just say what day it is. So day I. OK, so tomorrow, 50% chance of rain, 25% chance cloudy and nice, or nice and cloudy. Then 43%, 44% chance of rain on day two, 20% chance nice, 40% chance cloudy. OK, and notice it's starting to kind of converge. And by day six, we're pretty much at a steady state weather distribution. Okay, so in the near future, maybe a week out, using a crude model like this, even if it was nice today or cloudy today, you would have no certainty aside from these probability distributions of what the weather is going to be like in a few days, in five or six days. Okay, so old weather models had very short forecast times, largely because they were built on these probabilistic models. Okay. Um, we can always plot this in MATLAB. We can, uh, let's see, we can plot. Well, I didn't save any of the data. We'll do plotting later. Okay. Um, okay, are there any questions about this simple example? Okay, so on Friday, we're going to hit the ground running with ordinary differential equations. We're going to start with x dot equals a times x x dot equals a times x, just a one-dimensional linear first-order equation. If you don't feel comfortable with uh, calculus, I want you to review that between now and then. So the power law, chain rule, Taylor series. We're going to be using Taylor series a ton. It's the most powerful tool in calculus. That's what we're going to do on Friday. Okay, thank you.